So good afternoon. This is a lecture 12 with a course entitled Using Vector Calculus to Solve Problems in Electricity and Magnetism. I'm Dr. Richardson. My email address is listed, some administrative issues. Again, please take notes. Just don't sit down and copy what I write on the whiteboard. Learning is not a passive activity. You are strongly encouraged to do the problem sets. That's the only way you're going to learn the concepts in the course and how to apply them. And again, just looking at the solution key is not the best way to approach this. You can come back to a problem later or you could peek at parts of the solution key to give you a hint as to where you may have gone awry. You should ask questions, I'm available by email address and a ruler is useful certainly in constructing a lot of the diagrams that we're talking about in solving problems and looking at various coordinate systems. So this afternoon, we are going to discuss two very important theorems. in vector calculus and how they apply to electrostatics. And the first theorem we're gonna talk about is the so-called divergence theorem. So the divergence theorem has the word divergence in it. So let's recall that we had a very nice simple geometric interpretation several lectures ago and problem sets ago for what we meant by the divergence of a vector field, F. So the divergence of a vector field, F, tells us how much or how many vectors spread out from a given point in space for a vector field in this case F. My vector field here acts as a source. So remember we looked at some examples. If in fact the vector the divergence of the vector field F was positive, that at a particular point in space, the vector field is acting as a source of something. We looked at the case of uh, um, water. Or if the divergence was negative, it acted as a sink for the vector field. Okay, so the divergence theorem can be discussed in a nice physical geometrical picture. That's what we're gonna do next. We can come up with a somewhat rigorous proof for the divergence theorem. And I'm not gonna do that in lecture. I'll defer that to problem set 12, which should be available by next Tuesday online. Okay, so a nice way of looking at this is to imagine, so here's gonna be a, a nice physical way of discussing the divergence theorem. Suppose you have a region of space V and it's surrounded by a closed surface S. And suppose inside V, so V is a region of space that contains and a fluid, a liquid. And this fluid is going to be incompressible. It's exactly what it says. It can't be 
compressed at any one point. So this is that ideal assumption, and we're going to use this and run with it. But if you want to look at what real fluids do, that's the topic of fluid dynamics. So it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. So essentially, S is a closed surface that contains some volume of space that contains a liquid. So I am going to introduce, so this is sort of a thought experiment. But I'm going to introduce something which I'll call F, and that will simply be a faucet. And I'm going to introduce inside my volume lots of faucets, plural. So there are many of these located at various points throughout the volume of the incompressible liquid. And what happens when I turn on my faucets? Well, what will happen is clearly there will be excess fluid or liquid that is generated inside the volume. And that's going to push out fluids or liquid out through the surface. So let's write that down carefully. So when I turn on the faucets, what happens? My faucets, again, remember the system, the system initially had a volume that was completely full with my incompressible liquid. Then I put in these various faucets throughout the system. So it's a thought experiment. I turn them on and my faucets add additional liquid to the volume. So that additional liquid is going to push out existing liquid. It's got to go someplace. So it's going to exit the volume. So there will be an equal amount of liquid that will be forced out of the volume and it goes through the surface. Okay. So again, I have a system which consists of a volume V that's composed of an incompressible fluid. It's bounded by a closed surface S. I introduce into my volume of my incompressible liquid little microscopic faucets. And their purpose is to add additional liquid to the system. When I turn them on, this additional liquid is going to push out existing liquid from the volume and that it, that has to go somewhere so it has to leave that volume and it's clear that any additional liquid that's added to the volume by my forces has got to be compensated by an equal amount of liquid for leaving the volume and exiting through that surface so the question I want to ask is, how much liquid is being forced out through my surface S? And there are two ways to calculate this. First thing you could do logically is you could count all the faucets and record how much liquid each faucet is out. That certainly is one way to figure out how much liquid is being forced out through S. Another way is to simply look at 
a point on the surface and measure the flow of liquid at that point. That's going to tell you how much liquid is exiting the surface at that point. And then add all of these contributions up. And that'll give you the amount, total amount of fluid that leaves, of total amount of liquid that leaves the volume and that passes through the closed surface S that bounds the volume. So these two physical ways of calculating how the liquid, how much, how much liquid is being forced out through S, you can write these two statements mathematically. If you look at the amount of thought of liquid, leaving a faucet with inside the sphere, and then you count the number of faucets you have, all that is is doing an integral. Integration is just adding things together. But that has to be equal to the net flux or flow of liquid through the surface, S. And that's calculated by simply doing a surface integral over the entire closed surface. So in a, same, in a sense, this expression is just another way to look at conservation of matter, okay? Any excess liquid that's generated inside the volume due to my little microscopic faucets has got to be equal to fluid or liquid that's pushed out of the volume through the surface. And you can measure that by just calculating the flux or flow of, that li of the liquid through the surface. So end of English, now mathematics. The amount of fluid that come through one comes from one faucet is just the divergence of the vector field, F. If I want to add over all the faucets inside the volume, I have to do an integral over the entire volume. That's a volume integral. Then that has to equal the flux of F through the entire surface. That's a surface integral. And again, that surface integral is closed. So this is the divergence theorem. And we have derived it by using this nice, simple thought experiment of faucets inside an arbitrary volume bounded by a closed surface. So a couple of things you should recognize. The divergence theorem links a volume integral with a surface integral. So on the left-hand side, you have a volume integral. On the right-hand side, you have a surface integral. Second thing you should notice is that the divergence theorem has the right units. F is a vector field, but the divergence of a vector field is a scalar dv is just a differential value element. So the left-hand side is clearly a scalar. The right-hand side involves the dot product of my vector field, f, with a differential surface element, ds, and the dot product of two vectors is always a scalar. So dimensionally, I'm okay. Scalar equals a scalar. The units are right, okay? So, we have argued that this divergence theorem makes sense physically by just simply applying it, or de excuse me, rather deriving it in quotes from this example of uh, fluid mechanics. 
or water or my incompressible liquid. And it turns out that this divergence theorem can be proven in general. And it's not just true for any velocity field F, it's true for any vector field or function F. So again, I leave to problem set 12, a more rigorous derivation of this. And what I want to do next is actually see how all this works by going through an example to show you that the divergence theorem is something that you can tackle using all the um, techniques and skills we've developed so far. So I want to construct a unit cube. Unit cube is just a cube that has, uh, each side has length of one. And I'm going to orientate it in space as follows. So here's my unit cube. This up a little bit. So then, okay. So I'm gonna I'm going to use Cartesian coordinates for this problem. And I need to tell you where the origin is in this problem. So I'm going to construct this system. So the origin is at the corner of the cube. Here are the X, Y, and Z axes respectively. And this point here is X equals one. This is Y equals one. And this is Z equals one. Hence, this is why we call it a unit cube. And my unit cube is going to have six faces. So let me number them and define them. So my cube will have six faces or six sides. So side one will be the front side or surface two will be the back. Again, this is completely arbitrary, so you have to define it some way. Then I'm gonna call the right-hand side of my cube three, and the left-hand side I'm gonna call four. So, Surface S sub three will be on the right. Surface S sub four will be on the left. And I'm just left with the top and the bottom. And I'll call those S sub five and S sub six respectively. So S sub five is the top and S sub six is the bottom. And we've seen similar constructions like this before. So what I wanna do in this problem is I wanna confirm that the divergence theorem which is that the divergence of J through some volume, in this case, my volume is a unit cube, must equal the flux of the surface integral of J through S, where S is simply what you get when you add S one, two, three, four, five, six together. It's just the surface of this cube, which again is closed. Hence, I need my circle here. And I want to do this for a particular example of J, 
j is going to be y squared i hat, so it's a vector function. I need three components. Second component is going to be 2xy plus z squared j hat. And the third and final component will be 2yz k hat. Okay. So the task is to, in fact, show that this relationship is true for this value of a vector field, j, for this volume, a unit cube, and for a closed surface, which this completely encompasses my volume. It's just the surface of this cube. Okay, so um, I'm going to do this stepwise, and actually I'm going to do the hardest part first. I'm going to try to evaluate this. I'm going to do more than try. I will evaluate this surface integral on the right-hand side first. Then I will evaluate this volume integral on the left-hand side and show at the end of the day that these two results are equivalent. Okay, so I probably don't need this legend anymore. I'll keep my figure because it's still going to tell me some important things. And what I'm going to do is what I, was what I advertised. I'm going to attempt to calculate total flux of J through S. And that really breaks up into six parts. Namely, I have to calculate the surface integral through a surface S sub i of j dotted into a differential surface element d sub ds sub i. And add all of these six things up. Note that these surface integrals are not closed. The sides, each side of the unit cube is an open surface but the final result is the closed surface. So it would make sense just to do this one step at a time. So for S sub one, I'm gonna to need to know a couple of things. I'm gonna to need to know J. And again, I'll just write that again. J is just y squared i hat plus 2xy plus z squared i hat plus 2yz k hat d s sub 1 is a vector. It has direction and magnitude. And so if you look at this figure, it's clear that n sub 1 hat is just the unit vector i hat. d sub s1 is just the differential surface element dy times dz. So if, in fact, I take the dot product of j with ds sub 1, ds sub 1 only has a vector component i hat, so there's only going to be um, one contribution once I take that dot product of my uh, vector field, my vector function j. ds sub 1, its magnitude is just this. So in fact, this surface integral, the first surface integral of j dot ds sub 1, is just going to be a double integral of y squared dy dz. 
So there are two independent variables you're integrating over, y and z. y goes from 0 to 1, and z goes from 0 to 1. We picked a unit cube so we could have limits of integration that are pretty straightforward to evaluate. This is an elementary integral. You can evaluate it, and it comes out to be 1 third. OK, you're not finished. You have five other surfaces to worry about. <coughs> so the subscripts here are going to change. The result will change. But everything else I can sort of leave alone. And now address the problem about what about uh, surface S sub 2. So we'll save ourselves some space here. For S sub 2, n hat, the unit normal vector, is going to be minus i hat 1. ds sub 2 is going to be exactly the same as ds sub 1. So the only thing that changes is that n hat becomes negative and not positive. And the other thing you need to recognize is that over s sub 2, x is 0. All that follows from the figure. So if you then ask, what is the surface integral of j dotted into ds sub 2 over s sub 2, you can evaluate it by just taking the dot product of j with n hat and then multiplying that scalar by ds sub 2. And you should get a minus sign and you'll get a double integral. You'll have an integrand y squared dy dz. Again, I have a unit cube, so y goes from 0 to 1, z goes from 0 to 1. And to nobody's surprise, this answer is, is similar to that for s sub 1. It's just that there's a minus sign there due to the fact that you're looking at a surface s sub 2 that points in a different direction than s sub 1. OK, two down, three to go. So what's going to happen is my unit normal vectors will change. My differential surface element will change. My answer will be different. But the general form of the surface integral I need to calculate will be the same. So for S sub 3, the figure tells me that n hat, the unit normal vector, is just plus j hat. d S sub 2 is just dx dz. And if you look at the figure and study it carefully, you'll see that it's clear that over S sub 2, y is a constant. It's, in fact, equal to 1. So you will get a double integral once you take that dot product. Its integrand will be 2xy plus z squared. The variables of integration are independent of each other. They are x and z respectively. And again, the limits of integration go from 0 to 1. And again, recognize that this y is just 1 as a constant over s sub 3. So this, again, is the elementary integral. It can be evaluated. And you should check to see that it's 4 thirds. OK, so we've dealt with s sub 1, the front, s sub 2, the back. We've dealt with s sub 3, the right-hand side, now s sub 4. <coughs> 
So we set up this mechanism. So all we have to do is just get it running and exploit it. So what's happening with S sub four? For S sub four, the unit normal vector is minus I J hat. So it's it's a problem that's similar to the previous one and hat points in the opposite direction. But you have to be careful. And uh, so let's see where we need to be careful. DS of four is still going to be the same. The differential surface element is DX DY. Where you have to be careful is to recognize that over S sub four, y is zero. So in fact, when you sit down and do this surface integral by just taking the dot product of j with ds of four, and you have all the ingredients up there, you will get a double integral. The integrand involves, so there's a minus sign, I pull outside, the integrand involves 2xy plus z squared, and I'm integrating over two independent variables, x and z, and again, y is zero here. So again, this becomes an elementary integral, minus a third. And I next have to worry about s of five. That is the top of the cube. So again, let's get rid of everything that I don't need. So for S of five, by inspection of the figure and hat points in the positive K hat direction, D S of five is just D X D Y and the figure tells me that over the surface S sub five, the top of the cube, Z is one. So my double integral, once I take that dot product, is simply gonna be two Y Z DX DY. And again, the limits of integration, let's clear this up a little bit. The limits of integration are going to be the same for both variable because I have a unit cube and this will turn out to be one. Okay, so the final surface integral, you'd expect it to have some features that are very similar to that of S sub five. So let's look at S sub six. Okay, so n hat for s sub six, it's very similar to s sub five, but it's the opposite direction. The form for the differential surface element d sub s six is exactly identical to that of s sub five is dx times dy, but z is zero along the bottom of the cube, the way I've constructed it in this problem. So what you will get once you take the dot product is the following surface integral. It's a two-dimensional integral that you have to evaluate. And you can see that since z is always zero over s sub six, this result has no contribution, zero. So what I have discovered is that the flux of j through the surface of the cube has six contributions. They are a third minus a third plus four thirds minus a third plus one plus zero, and they all add up to two. So what we have shown 
is that for this particular example, the divergence theorem, which again involves a volume integral, you relate a volume integral to a surface integral. You have a volume, so you need three things. You need a vector function, j. You need some volume, v. And you need a closed surface that encompasses that volume. This thing on the right-hand side is just the flux of a vector field through a closed surface. We knew how to calculate that before today's lecture. And it turns out that that actually equals 2. What we need to do next to prove this expression, this expression again is the divergence theorem. To prove the divergence theorem, we need to evaluate this volume integral. So we need to do two things, maybe more. So let me remind you what J is. It's a vector field, vector function. It has a component y squared plus i hat plus 2xy plus z squared times j hat plus 2 times xz times the unit vector k hat. So if you're going to evaluate the volume integral on the left-hand side of the divergence theorem, in this example, you're going to have to calculate the divergence of j. And that's something we know how to do. It's just a scalar. It turns out to be 2x plus 2y. Then the final thing we need to do is this volume integral. We need to integrate 2x plus 2y over the volume. In this case, it's a cube. And the differential volume element for the Q is just dx, dy, dz. And we know the limits of, we know each one of these variables, x, y, z, each one is independent. And we know the limits of integration for each one of those variables. It goes from 0 to 1. And so this is a volume integral that you can calculate. And you need to show that, in fact, that equals 2. So in fact, for this example, the divergence theorem, we explicitly show that is true. And you'll have other examples to play with this in problem set um, 12. And again, you've got to do two things. You've got to evaluate a surface integral, which is usually the hardest thing to do when you want to prove the divergence theorem for a particular vector field. And then you have to evaluate a volume integral of the divergence of that vector field over that volume. And that's typically an easier thing to do. So that's why I did the right-hand side first. OK, and you'll see at least one other example of how to use this in problem set 12. OK, so it's probably useful to look at an application of the divergence theorem. Excuse me. So we're going to look at an application of the divergence theorem. in the subject that we're talking about, electrostatics. What we've proven so far is that the divergence theorem works for any arbitrary vector field. So we want to actually apply it to some ideas of electrostatics, see if we can learn something new. So again, the basics, basis for electrostatics is Coulomb's law. And you could rewrite Coulomb's law in terms of Gauss's law, which says that the flux of an electric field through some closed surface doesn't have to be spherical, it can be arbitrary. We proved that. That has to equal the charge enclosed by that surface divided by the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught. Now, I'll leave the left-hand side of Gauss's law alone, and I'll just look at the right-hand side. The charge enclosed is a surface integral. 
over some volume charge density times a differential volume element. We've seen that before in lots of previous examples. Now we want to do something new. We actually want to use the divergence theorem to Gauss's law. And the divergence theorem would say that the flux of the electric field through some closed surface equals the volume integral of the divergence of the electric field. Well, that's going to imply that you can write Gauss's law, which is the flux of the electric field through some closed surface, as the, the volume integral of the divergence of the electric field. But you also know from Gauss's law that the flux of the electric field through some arbitrary closed surface also equals another volume integral. It's one over epsilon naught times the volume integral of the volume charge density times dV. So since these volume that you're integrating over are the same, the integrands for these two final expressions must be the same. And you get the following result, that the divergence of the electric field must equal the volume charge density divided by epsilon naught. So starting with Gauss's law and then using the divergence theorem, we can, through a very simple set of steps, which make logically, which make logic, uh, which are logically correct, get a new expression. So let's explore this expression and see what it's telling us. So what we've discovered is, is that the divergence of the electric field equals the volume charge density divided by epsilon naught. And this really came from Gauss's law, which says that the flux of the electric field through some arbitrary closed surface equals the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. So both of these guys are Gauss's law. They're just different ways to write it. In this form, you're talking about taking a derivative. So this is really called the differential form of Gauss's law. And it tells you what's going on at a particular point in space with regard to the vector field. The, the integral form of Gauss's law tells you you have to do a surface integral first before you get anything useful. And again, if you have a situation where you have high symmetry, then you can actually evaluate that surface integral. So this expression that the divergence of the electric field equals the volume charge density divided by the permittivity of free space, is just another way to write Gauss's law, but it tells you what's going on at a point in space. And in some ways, it's a much more useful creature than just worrying about Gauss's law, where you have to do a surface integral over an infinite number of points in space. This equation has another name. It's known as the first Maxwell equation. This is beyond the scope of this course to discuss Maxwell's laws and how you get electromagnetic radiation and light from them. But this is one of the first necessary steps that you're going to have to make. Okay, and uh, we'll come back and use this first Maxwell equation or Gauss's law in a different form in another set of applications at the, uh, later on in today's lecture. So again, you'll have practice with using the divergence theorem in problem set 12 and a more rigorous proof of the divergence theorem I'll leave to that problem set. So there's another important theorem, 
that we are now ready to state and prove. And that's Stokes' theorem. And let us start out with the following observation. The divergence theorem tells us something about the divergence of a vector field. Stokes' theorem is going to tell us something about the curl of a vector field. So remember, we saw this creature before. So let's write this out in words before we look at the mathematics. If we look at a point in a vector field F, and the curl of that vector field is not zero, then physically, it's always helpful to start out with some physical uh, examples first before we generalize it. Physically, this vector field looks like a whirlpool. that point. Apologies for the typo. A whirlpool at that point. So we went through a couple of examples of this in the problem sets especially. Remember, if you place a tiny paddle wheel at the point where the curl of the vector field doesn't equal zero, the wheel will rotate. And we looked at this example in the context of a vector field which was describing a fluid because that's very easy to visualize. So the curl of a vector field tells us something about the ability of that vector field to rotate or tells us something about circulation. Okay. So for the problem of Stokes theorem, we'll forget Stokes theorem, forget that, forget that word. Let's just look, step back and look at the problem we want to solve. So suppose you have a vector field F, could be water, it could be a, a, a velocity profile of that is it easier for you to both to visualize. And suppose we look at just in two dimensions, some region of space S bounded by some curve C that's closed. And inside this surface is a fluid that's rotating at any point in space. So if you pick a particular point in space, you will see if you have a non-zero curl, you will see that fluid rotating. So what we would like to do is let us add up all of the circulations at every point in space for F. So add up all the results for the, cur cur the curl of F inside my surface over all 
points. Yes. And it will turn out that the result that you get is just going to be equal to the circulation of F over the boundary of the surface C, this closed surface. So there's a very simple way to see how this works. Let's just look at two cases. If you pick two points inside S, and let's just say that the circulation is going counterclockwise, and you merge those two boxes together, what happens is, is that any activity at the boundary is canceled out. Because the direction of the circulation is one is upward for this guy, but it's downward for this guy. When you merge those two together, it disappears. So the net effect is of adding these two results together, you're left with just calculating the circulation over the boundary. Now, I, I use nice little rectangles here. I could have easily done the same I could have easily have illustrated the same point by using these circular regions. Now, let me just clear this up a little bit. I'll keep that. And the net of the same thing would have happened if I just took two of these guys and combined them. Then what happens on the right hand side of this one? gets canceled by what happens on the left-hand side of that one. So remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out, is there any relationship between adding up the curl of F, the circulation of F at points inside S? And the answer is yes. When you're, everything is said and done, your final result should be equivalent to simply calculating the circulation over the entire boundary, which is closed. So I would like to say this mathematically. So again, what do I want to say in words? I want to take the circulation or curl of my vector field F at a point S anywhere inside that surface. And then I want to add this up over the surface. So that's an integral. And in fact, it's a surface integral. And what I've discovered by that picture is I'll get an answer that has to be the same as the circulation, excuse me, of F over the boundary of S. And that boundary is a circle, or a boundary is a path that's closed, hence this circle through the integral. And now I can write this mathematically as the left-hand side is just the surface integral of the curl of F over every point inside S, but I have to be careful. Surfaces are vectors and not areas, they're vectors. 
and I just can't take the curl of f and put it next to ds. I've got to do something. So what I want to do is just take the dot product of those two. So this is what you would do if you want to add up the circulation of f or the curl of f at every point inside s. And that has to be equal to the line integral of f over the closed path C that covers S. This thing on the left-hand side is a surface integral. We know how to evaluate surface integrals. This thing on the right-hand side is a line integral. And we spent a lot of time talking about how to evaluate line integrals. Let's check for units. The right-hand side, you have a vector dotted into a vector. So that means that this thing is a scalar. And now you see why I had to introduce this dot product here. The curl of a vector field is a vector. The uh, differential surface element, because area is a vector, that's also a vector. So I have to get a result on the left-hand side that involves a scalar. And I can only do that by putting a dot product there. Putting a cross product wouldn't do anything because that cross product of two vectors is a vector. So this thing on the left-hand side dimensionally is a scalar. So this is Stokes' theorem. Um, I will give you a more rigorous derivation of it in problem set 12. Um, another way to see how it works and what it means is to actually go to an example. We'll do that in a minute. But there is one remaining problem that we have to address that we haven't paid attention to, namely the direction. I have picked my surface and I've defined its boundary and I've used these arrows to give you the direction of which you're going to do the line integral. But what's so unique about that? Could I not have picked arrows that went in an opposite direction? So there's some ambiguity that we have to clear up and we'll do that by using a friend that we talked about in lecture one back in June, right-hand rule. So the right-hand rule, once again, is gonna come back and save us. So when you do line integrals, you have to pay attention to the fact that the path over which you're doing the integral has a direction. So in this case, I have an open surface designated by the red hatched area. And there will be a differential surface, <coughs> excuse me, there's a differential surface vector ds that has a direction, and its direction is defined in a way that n hat obeys the right hand rule. note the direction of which these arrows are going. If I reverse the directions of the arrows, so I did something like this, and in fact, ds would point in that direction. So the anytime you have an area and you have a boundary, encompassing that area, you have to tell me the direction of the path that the boundary is taking. And that's also going to tell you how to define the unit normal vector with respect to that surface. If you have a closed surface, there's no such ambiguity. The unit normal vector is always outward. 
Okay, so let's see how this works in an example. This is an example of Stokes' theorem. And I'll give you a couple other examples to look at in problem set four. So let's just write down what Stokes' theorem is again. It is on the one side, a surface integral involving the curl of a vector field, and that's related to the line integral of the vector field over a closed path that encompasses the surface. So if you're going to prove or use Stokes' theorem, you need three things. First thing you need is a vector field, F. Second thing you're gonna need is some surface. Somebody has to give you a surface. And the third thing you're gonna need is a closed curve, C, that encompasses that surface. You have to define that closed curve and you have to define the direction that you want to go over that closed curve. So the example I'm going to pick is one in rectangular coordinates, Cartesian coordinates. So let me use my unit vectors to show what's going on. I hat, J hat, K hat. So I'll tell you what the vector field is in a minute, but let me first focus on S. So here's X, Y, Z. So X is gonna be a surface that I'll highlight in red. It obviously exists only in the YZ plane. And the surface is bounded by some closed curve. That closed curve C has three parts to it, excuse me, four parts, C sub one, C sub two, C sub three, and C sub four. And here I'll define each of those paths. So when you do a line integral or a path integral or a contour integral, small c, when I say contour integral, I'm not talking about complex variable theory. I have to tell the audience what the direction of c is. Okay, so I need my vector field. So in this example, Let's look at the vector field. It only have it will only have two components, two x a plus three y squared. That will be the j hat component, and it will have a z component of four y z squared. So I want to show that Stokes' theorem is true for this vector field. So I have my vector field. I need S, I have that. And I need C, I have that. So I'm gonna do this in a very similar fashion to the previous example of the divergence theorem. I am going to look at the right-hand side of Stokes' theorem first. I'm gonna evaluate that line integral because Quite frankly, that's the, more, that's the more challenging task at hand. Now I get that solved, then the rest, it's all downhill from there. And then I'll do the left-hand side left, uh, last, and then show these two are the same. Okay, so the process is very similar to what we looked at using the divergence theorem but a specific application is a little different. So let's be careful. So I'm going to have to do the right-hand side. 
by evaluating this line integral of f dot dr. And I'm going to have to do it by breaking the problem up into four parts. So I'm going to need to evaluate a dr sub i over a particular path c sub i and do it four times. And my path or paths are just defined here. Okay, so let's do it. So let's pick the first one. First line integral I want to tackle is going to be the line integral over c sub 1. Note there's no circle here through the integrand, the integral sign. This is a, uh, an open, it's just a path, it's not closed. dr in Cartesian coordinates is just i hat dx plus j hat dy plus k hat dz. My vector function or vector field is 2xz plus 3y squared j hat plus 4yz squared i hat. I'm going to need to know clearly the dot product of these two creatures. And that's going to be 2xz plus 3yz dy, all scalars, plus 4yz squared dz. OK, so for c sub 1, along path c sub 1, it's clear that z is 0. It's also clear that x is 0. So the only variable that you have to worry about is y. She goes from 0 to 1. So in fact, the line integral of f dot dr along c sub 1 simply reduces, once you take these facts, take these three facts, and apply them to the dot product of f with dr, and all you have to do is evaluate an elementary integral from 0 to 1 of 3y squared dy, and you should confirm that equals 1. So that's one path down, two to go. So I can keep everything over here. I need that, I keep that, I can keep that, and I keep that. And now I'm doing my line integral over a different path, so all of this has to change. So my path will be c sub 2. Along c sub 2, y is 1, x is 0, and the only variable of integration that changes is z. Note, not only is y equal to 0, well, I'm sorry, not only y is 1, x is 0, and z goes from 0 to 1. The fact that y is a constant, in particular 1, implies that dy is 0. So use these four facts, apply them to the dot product of f dot dr, and it's easy to show that the line integral of f over path c sub 2 is simply going to be a one-dimensional integral for z squared dz. Everything else is just going to disappear from 0 to 1. And that's going to be 4 thirds. So you're actually going to get a number. Okay. Um, Two down, three to go, two to go. Uh, 
So again, in doing the third line integral, I only need all of this information. So one, two, three, four. I only need that as I did from the previous examples. The new piece of information I'll need to figure out is what happens along the path C sub three. That's why it's called a path integral. You have to think about over the path that you're doing the integration. So for C sub three, and again, we've dealt with line integrals before. So this is really a review. Z is one. So its derivative is zero since Z is a constant. X will be zero. And Y goes from, and we have to be very careful here. Y is going to go from one to zero. So I've made this point before. When you do line integrals, the smartest thing to do is to write the differential line element dr as just i hat dx plus j hat dy plus k hat dz. Leave it like that. That's what it is. Don't try to worry about directions and putting in signs for unit vectors. Leave that to the last step of the calculation where you put in the limits of in integration because everything will come out correctly then. I mean, you don't have to do the problem this way, but it's much easier to just write dr in its general form. And then when you come up to the limits of integration, like here, look at path three. Path three, you start here and you end up there. So you start where x equals, where y equals one, excuse me, and you end up where y equals zero. zero. So that will tell you, the figure tells you what the limits of integration are. Okay, so let's apply all that to the line integral over C sub three of F. That is exactly what we mean. With these facts that Z equals one and DZ equals zero and Y equals zero, it's easy to show the dot product of F dot DR simplifies to three Y squared DY and again, you're starting from y equals one and ending up at y equals zero. That's where the direction of the arrow tells you. And you wouldn't be surprised to see that this result gives you a minus sign. So we've conquered three creatures, c sub one, c sub two, c sub three integrals or path integrals over those, uh, excuse me, segments we have fourth and final problem to deal with, C sub four. So again, let's get rid of everything we don't need so that we can look at the problem at hand. So C sub four, along C sub four, the figure tells us that X equals zero and Y equals zero. So clearly dx and dy all vanish. Z is your variable. And again, look at the figure. You start here and you end up there. So Z has to go from one to zero. So our fourth line integral over C sub four when you realize that x equals zero and y equals zero, let's go over here. This first term is going to vanish, no contribution. This second term is going to vanish. There's no contribution. And look, this third and final term is going to vanish because y equals zero. So in fact, that guy is going to be equal to zero. So I have four results. I combine them all together and I find that the path integral over the closed curve that bounds that square 
given the geometry that we defined is going to be equal to 1 plus 4 thirds minus 1 plus 0 equals 4 thirds. So that's one half of Stokes' theorem. The other half of Stokes' theorem is that the curl of f dotted into ds must integrate it over a surface. This thing also has to be 4 thirds. So let me remind you what f is. Again, f is a vector field. It's 2xz plus 3y squared j hat plus 4yz squared k hat. So I know and you know how to evaluate the curl of a vector field. And it's easy to show that that's just going to be i hat for z squared plus k hat to z minus i hat to x. So to evaluate the surface integral, I need two things. I need the curl of the vector field. I have that. And now I need the vector ds. So if you go back and look at well, I don't mind redrawing it again. So here's x, y, and z. Here is s. Here's c. I don't have to put in the directions of c, um, but I'll do it anyway. It's the path. These are the directions of c. And note that n hat for my surface, that this thing is going to be in the plus i hat direction. So n hat is in the plus i hat direction. ds, the differential surface element, is just dy dz. So I really have all three things that I need. I'll write this, but this is superfluous. ds, the differential surface element, is a consists of a vector times a magnitude. And so I know all three of these things. So all I have to do is take the dot product of item one with item four get a result, and then integrate that over my surface. So I'm going to leave that to you to show that in problem set 12, that this result will actually be the same. It'll be 4 thirds. We'll get a result, and it's identical. So I'll leave that for you to show in problem set 12. And I also will give you another example of applying um, Stokes' theorem. OK. So just as we looked at applications for the divergence theorem, in electrostatics, we should address the issue of applications of Stokes' theorem in electrostatics. Stokes' theorem is true in general. It's true for any vector field. But in particular, it's going to have some interesting um, consequences in electrostatics. So the first comment I want to make is, Recall our friend, the electric field, E. Uh, 
comment that the observation we should make, we probably skipped over looking at this. We probably didn't realize this, but the electric field is not just any old vector function or field. For a vector field to be the electric field, it has to have some special property. So for example, if I just wrote down the following vector field, y i hat, and actually plotted this thing in two dimensions, it would look as follows. Remember, a vector field tells you, you pick a point in space, and then at that point in space, you put a vector. So at, at uh, x equals 0 and y equals 0, let's just start long, x equal, at, at y equals 0. At y equals 0, then the, the vector you're going to put there is just the 0 vector. Now, for values of y, 1, 2, 3, 1.5, 6.7, there's going to be a vector that points in the positive i hat direction. And it's going to have a magnitude that keeps increasing depending upon what the value of y is. So along the y-axis, that's what the electric field looks like. Since this electric field does not depend upon x, then this result that you've plotted is going to be true everywhere. So you're going to get an electric field that everywhere in space looks like this. Excuse me. You're going to get a vector field in everywhere in space. At everywhere in space, it looks like that. And the point is, there is no charge distribution. I misspoke, but I made it an important symbol. There's no, this electric, this vector field is not an electric field. There's no charge distribution possible that will generate an electric field that looks like that. Another observation you want to make is if you sit down and do the work of calculating the curl of this electric field, you won't get zero. And then if you write down and play with electric fields or vectors that you know are electric fields, and calculate their curl, you will find it is zero. So just because you can write down a vector field, it doesn't mean that that vector field is an electric field. It is only an electric field, only, let me be a little bit more careful, it's only an electrostatic field if its curl does not vanish. Because here's an example of a vector field that clearly there's no line distribution, surface charge distribution, volume charge distribution, arrangement of discrete point charges that in any way, shape, or form will ever generate an electric field that looks like that. And I'm going to give you some extra problems and problems at 12 to look at this to hammer this point home. It's a non trivial point, but it's an important point. Well, it's non trivial and important. So what we have discovered is that if an electric field is an electrostatic field, ah, sorry, I misspoke again. If a vector E, if a vector function E, if a vector field E is in fact not just a vector function or vector field, but an electrostatic field, very special type of vector function, if then clause, then its curl has to be equal to zero. And think about this, show this for a point charge. You know what the electric field is for a point charge. 
will calculate its curl and show that in fact, that has to vanish. So I said that this was an application of Stokes' theorem. Well, how is this going to be useful? Well, Stokes' theorem, when you apply it to electrostatics, tells you the following. Stokes' theorem is going to tell you that the surface integral of the curl of the electric field, so now E is a special field. Well, let's just, yeah, it's a special field, it's the electric field. dotted into ds must equal the line integral of s over some closed path. Since this field is an electric field, this vector field is a special field, it's an electrostatic field, the curl of E is zero, so that means that the line integral of E over some closed path is zero. And that tells you that this line integral is path independent. So let's see how that works. So if you have two points in space, A and B, Let's say there are two different paths that you can use to go from A to B. Stokes' theorem tells you that the electrostatic field has a line integral that vanishes over some closed path, C. And furthermore, it tells you that if you go from A to B, this result is path independent. And it does not depend on how you got or how you get from A to B. Call this path one, call this path two. And this is an easy way to see why this is true. Otherwise, you could go from A E on path I, and you could return to A on path Roman numeral two, and then you would get a result that says that this line integral doesn't vanish. So the fact that the electrostatic field has a curl that equals zero, and the fact that Stokes theorem is true when you apply it to, when you apply the fact that the curl of the electric field is zero to Stokes theorem, that tells you that the line integral over a closed path is zero, or that the line integral from A to B gives you the same result regardless of which path you use. We have seen this before. This allowed us to define the electrostatic potential, which is a scalar function. And it comes from the fact that I don't care how you get from A to B. I'm just worried about the difference in the electrostatic potential. Okay, one last comment. We have shown 
that the electrostatic potential and the electric field are related by the fact that the electric field is minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. Now there's more information to mine out of this. Stokes theorem tells you that the curl of the electric field is zero. And we showed that ordinary vector analysis reveals that if the curl of a vector field is zero, then the curl of the gradient of any scalar field also equals zero. Hence the connection between the electric field and the gradient of the electrostatic potential. And we put in that minus sign to take into account how we dealt with force with dealing with Coulomb's law. So let us summarize where we are. On the left-hand side, we've got our friend Carl Frederick Gauss, Gauss's law. Gauss's law says that the flux of the electric field through some arbitrary closed surface equals the enclosed charge divided by permittivity of free space. If you use the divergence theorem, then you can rewrite Gauss's law into its different and recast it in terms of its differential form that the divergence of the electric field equals the volume charge density divided by epsilon naught. And you will have examples, at least one, of showing how to use this expression in problem set 12. Now over here, I want to look at electric the properties of electric fields, where these electric fields are static. And what I know is, thanks to I know that the curl of an electric field has to be equal to zero. I know, thanks to vector analysis, that that means that the electric field can be related to the gradient of some scalar potential. And I'll just say this, and I may come back to this later, either in the problem set or next lecture. I can relate these two expressions, three and four, and realize that I can get the divergence of the gradient of the electrostatic potential with the minus sign here must equal the volume charge density divided by epsilon naught. The divergence of the gradient is an operator which we'll call the Laplacian. And we've actually seen that in a previous problem set. And this particular equation is going to be very useful because it'll give us another way of calculating the electrostatic potential. And this is referred to as Poisson's equation. So next lecture will be the final lecture. I will review the material on this particular whiteboard and say a little bit more about Poisson's equation and something called Laplace's equation. And then I will do a very brief introduction into how magnetism works or how magnetostatics works. So again, the body of this course was, excuse me, intended to review vector analysis multivariable calculus coordinate systems and how they apply to electrostatics. We only have 12 lectures to do that. We've done that. We've come to an end. Um, and we've gone through lots of problem set examples, about 120 of them. Actually, probably about 100 and 
50 if you take the examples done in lecture. And I do want to say something about magnetism. It's going to be very short and sweet, but at least show something about what we know about magnetic fields and magnetostatics and how, again, vector calculus can come and help us out. Thank you very much.